Hi, I'm Jack Crutchfield, and welcome to Obscurely Famous Graves. And remember, it's not just the history behind that person, but some of the odd places that they're buried. So when you put the two together, for a true history buff, it's hard to resist. I'm calling today's segment, The President and the Rock Star. The location is Forest Lawn Cemetery in Buffalo, New York. So let's get started, and we'll start with The President. His name was Millard Fillmore. He was president from 1850 to 1853, and history has not been kind to Mr. Fillmore. He is consistently ranked at the bottom of almost every list of presidents. Remember, though, presidents didn't have the power before the Civil War that they had after. The result of that giant federal army and the expanded control of the federal government, um, states' rights took a hit on that. Uh, but when Fillmore was president, states' rights were a whole lot more important. He grew up in poverty. Uh, he was apprenticed to some people. He didn't like that. Uh, but he did graduate from law school at the age of 23. He was first elected to the state legislature in New York. Then he lost a bid running for governor. And he became the New York State's comptroller. Um, then he was like a surprise pick for Zachary Taylor's vice president. And he was considered an accidental president. There were five. Um, when Zachary Taylor died in office, um, he became president. And he's one of only five presidents that were not elected. He had no vice president because not until 1967, when the 25th Amendment was passed, was the president actually allowed to pick his own VP, subject to the approval of Congress, of course. I'm going to interject something kind of funny here, at least I think it is. Um, you probably have seen a picture of Miller Fillmore, because if you ever look at some of those uh, funny subjects on the Internet where they'll say that these people are time travelers and these stars are, uh, they resemble uh, people from the past, but they, so they must be time travelers. Well, Miller Fillmore is actually uh, kind of a lookalike for Alec Baldwin on a, on a bad day, <laughs> but... Um, a lot of people have to put that craziness out there, and I thought it is kind of funny. If you look, there is a resemblance. Here it is. Um, so I thought I'd stick that in there. But let's get back to Millard's presidency. Um, he said he was personally opposed to slavery, but he valued the preservation of the Union above all. So he supported the Compromise of 1850, which actually allows newly formed territories to decide the slavery question themselves. That didn't go over too well. Um, he must have had some humility, though. Uh, there's a, a major story that he personally helped fight a fire in the Library of Congress, went down and helped them out. I can't really imagine the president today doing something like that. Um, and then he signed a bill to replace the destroyed books. That was pretty cool. He was never even nominated by his own party for a second term. He lost to Winfield Scott, who was a big military hero. But then Scott lost to Franklin Pierce, who's also considered one of the worst presidents ever, by only winning four of 31 states. So it must have been a real rear-end kicking for the Whig Party. In 1855, he ran as an anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant member of the Know Nothing Party. Uh, he only carried one state, and that was Maryland. So as I said, he was consistently ranked at the, at the bottom, in the bottom five, the, the White House's official site says he was uninspiring. Ouch, that would hurt from somebody talking about your presidency. He's buried with both of his wives. And to add insult to injury, when he married his second wife, who was uh, independently wealthy, he had to sign a prenup. Millard Fillmore, 13th president of the United States, who gets a pretty bad rap today. Except when they compare him to Alec Baldwin, I guess. But let's move on to our rock star now. And this guy is the absolute polar opposite of Millard Fillmore. His real name is James Ambrose Johnson Jr. And I bet you don't know who he is from that name. But his stage name was Rick James. Yes, that Rick James. I'm Rick James. And you know the rest if you're a grown-up. Mr. Super Freak himself. Born in 1948, he was known as much for his private life as he was for his career. He was born in Buffalo, he did dime in jail when he was in his teens for theft. He was introduced to drugs. Uh, he joined the Navy, deserted, and did time for that, too. His time was reduced, thanks to the help of his cousin, 
who is, coincidentally, Congressman Lewis Stokes Jr., who's a pretty well-known fellow in his own right. During these troubles, or in between, <laughs> he made friends with Joni Mitchell, Neil Young, and Nick St. Nicholas. And if you haven't heard of Nick St. Nicholas, he was a member of the band Steppenwolf. James was a talented singer, songwriter, and producer. He wrote songs for The Miracles, The Spinners, The Temptations, The Mary Jane Girl, Smokey Robinson, Eddie Murphy. That's pretty impressive. He also sold millions of records as a solo artist, and his best-known song was called Super Freak. MC Hammer sampled that song. You might, Some of you younger people might remember that song from the 90s called um, Can't Touch This. Probably thanks to his drug addiction, he was convicted of kidnapping and assault and did two years at Folsom Prison during the 90s. Uh, he was working on his autobiography, The Confessions of Rick James, Memoirs of a Super Freak, when he died from various health conditions at the age of 56. Imagine what that talent would have accomplished if there had been no drugs. So who knows? So there you have it, the president and the rock star, probably two of the most diverse people that could possibly be, both buried at Forest Lawn Cemetery in Buffalo, New York. But here are a couple of honorable mentions. First honorable mention, Red Jacket. He was a Seneca Native American and chief of the Wolf Clan. And he was called that for the red coat he got from the British for supporting them during the Revolutionary War. Pick the wrong side. He was well known for his oratorical skills. And after the war, he negotiated with the new United States of America to try to help his tribe. George Washington gave him something he called a peace medal. Uh, for his efforts, and he wore it in every single portrait painted of him. He was a very important Native American, but almost forgotten today. Definitely worth reading about, though. Really obscurely famous. Second honorable mention is Victoria Sutherland. And I don't know why this intrigued me a little bit, but the only thing I can find about her is that she and her sisters were a vaudeville act. And their big distinction was their very long hair. Look at these pictures. All I can say is, that is a serious sacrifice for fame. Imagine washing that and just the weight of all that hair. In any age, in any era, Victoria Sutherland. Now, the last honorable mention is the one I like the best. His name is Alfred Southwick. He was a Buffalo dentist. He was an engineer and he was an inventor. Now, here's a guy you've never heard of, Alfred Southwick, but You've heard of something he did. He invented the electric chair. And everybody knows about that, and he's basically forgotten. But old Sparky, everybody knows about that chair. Those are the honorable mentions at the Forest Lawn Cemetery in Buffalo, New York. And that does it for this segment of Obscurely Famous Graves. But if you get a chance, visit our website at obscurelyfamous.net. There's probably 50 or 60 obscurely famous graves that you might not have heard of there. Some of them you have, some of them you haven't. But if you get a chance, we'd like for you to visit. Thanks again for spending some time with us, and I'll see you next time.